Welcome to section 10.2. We're actually going to be calculating our hypothesis test now. We're going to start with our population proportion. So remember that's our parameter and we use the letter P. Okay, so um, recall the point estimate of P is P hat, so X over N. Um, so again, we're going to be using our sampling distribution of P hat. It's approximately normal with our mean is P and our standard deviation formula. If, and again it's three things, we have a simple random sample, MP times 1 minus P is greater than or equal to 10, and N is less than 5% of our population. So we have two ways to test our hypotheses. So essentially we're going to see if our point estimate is considered unusual. And we're going to use the classic approach or the p-value approach. And again, both those ways determine if an event is unusual based on the current status quo sampling distribution. If it's unusual, we call it statistically significant and we reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so let's see how this is done. Let's take a look at a normal curve. All right, and we'll make it the standard normal curve. Okay, um, and we have, we'll do Z sub 0 0.05. So remember that notation means the area to the right is 0 0.05. So if we have a point estimate and its Z score lands somewhere in that region, that 0 0.05 region, we can just call it Z0. Z0 would be considered an unusual event. So if Z0 is to the right, of Z sub 0 0.05, it's in that red zone and Z0 is an unusual event. So if that was a point estimate and we're testing a hypothesis, that would mean if it's unusual we would reject the status quo. It means that curve is wrong and the curve probably looks different. So H0 is the hypothesis. Um, we call that red zone the critical region. So when we're testing our hypotheses, um, we can really say if Z0, the Z-score of a point estimate, if Z0 is in the critical region, we reject the null. And that would show evidence that it supports the alternative. Okay, so how we determine if something is in the critical region, we have two ways. The first is the classical approach. So in the classical approach, we look at standard deviations. And if p hat is too many standard deviations away. So for instance, we could say bigger than Z sub 0 0.05 from the mean or from the proportion stated in the null hypothesis we reject the null. Okay, so that's one way and that's us saying something like um, Z0 is bigger than Z sub 0 0.05. So again, going up to our picture, 
that would be us saying that z naught is farther away than z sub 0 0.05. So that means we're in the critical region. Um, we can also look at the probability of getting z naught. So we're going to use the words as extreme or more extreme. So the probability of getting as extreme or more extreme a value as z naught, notice that this probability, this area in green, is smaller than the area in red. So we can also compare probabilities, we can also compare areas. And that's called the p-value approach. So a p-value is the probability of observing a sample statistic as extreme or more extreme than the one observed under the assumption that the statement in the null hypothesis is true. Poof. Okay, so um, if the probability of getting p hat as extreme or more extreme so they're just saying that to um, accommodate all of your tests. So in our case, we are drawing a right tail test, so it would be greater than or equal to. If it was a left tail test, we would say less than or equal to. So as extreme or more extreme is what we're saying for now to accommodate all three tests. All right, and then that the probability of getting p hat as extreme or more extreme, that's your p-value. If this is small, that means it's a low probability. So it's an unusual event. So again, we're going to reject the null. All right. So those are our two methods. Let's make a quick note before we start doing our calculations. If H naught, the null hypothesis, is true, we will incorrectly or falsely reject the null five percent of the time in this case. So let's go back up to our curve. So the whole thing, if we're rejecting the null, we, we're actually saying that this curve is incorrect. All right, we're actually saying that this curve is incorrect. So in this case, maybe the curve looks more like over here, right? Um, but let's say this is actually correct. The null hypothesis is true. Well, 5% of the data is just going to naturally fall in here. So 5% of the data is going to naturally fall in the critical region, which means we're going to reject the null. But it's true. So that's what we just wrote down. So we're going to falsely reject the null 5% of the time. Um, when we falsely reject the null, that's a type 1 error. So the probability of a type 1 error, falsely rejecting the null, is 0 0.05. And we also know that that is alpha. We looked at that in your activity packet from section 10.1. OK, so alpha is going to be called our level of significance. It's going to be called our level of si significance. It's what we're really defining an unusual event to be. All right, so let's look at our example. It's a five-step procedure. We're going to go through all the steps in detail, and then we're going to have a clever acronym to help us. So this is just kind of building our theory. And then we'll look at an example of what your work's going to look like. So first of all, we have to make sure we have um, our qualifications, simple random sample, and p times 1 minus p greater than or equal to 10, and independence. Whoops. Data entry error less than 0 
So your first step is to determine the null and alternative. And remember we have three tests. Um, they all look start off the same. You state your null first and your alternative. And we are dealing with P. Do not write P hat. I will take points off because we don't run our tests on sample statistics. We're running tests on parameters. We already know, have all the information about samples, so we don't need to write anything. Okay, so um, we're going to call the value, it's just going to be like P naught. P naught can be like 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.15. Um, and then they're all the same. We don't change it. So P naught is normally in the problem. Um, null is always an equal sign. So we have that. And then we have three different types of tests. We have right tail. We have a left tail test. And then two tail test. Okay, so those are our null and alternative statements. So after that, we're going to select a level of significance. It's given to us some problems. It's not there. So the default is alpha is 0 0.05. But for the most part, it's always going to be there significance and again alpha it's the probability of making a type 1 error okay and then we're going to compute our test statistic and it's the z-score from our sample statistic and we call it a test statistic. All right, so it's a z-score, so we'll use z sub naught. And then this formula is on your formula sheet. So p hat is our point estimate. We assume the null is true when we're making our distributions. So the status quo is going to be p naught. So again, this p naught is a number like 0 0.5, 0 0.87, depends on the problem. So we subtract the mean, and then we divide by the standard deviation. And again, we're on the sampling distribution of the sample proportion. All right, so again, P naught comes from the null. All right, now we have to determine if it's unusual or not. I have a weird gap. You don't have that weird gap. Okay, so the classical approach, we have to see if it's enough standard deviations away. So that was that Z sub 0 0.05. That's a critical value, right, from Chapter 9. So that's your first step. And again, you can find all the critical values at the bottom of your Z chart. Or you can use inverse norm. Okay, so for um, a two-tailed test, your alpha is going to be split up between the two tails. So the alpha is split up between the two tails. So it's z sub alpha over 2 and negative z sub alpha over 2. All right, those are your critical values. Let's write out all the critical values. Then we have two-tailed tests. We'll go back and write our conclusion just a little bit. We have right-tailed, 0.5. 
So if level of significance is alpha, then now it's just z sub alpha. And so alpha, the critical region, will be alpha. Then we have our left tailed. Oops. So negative z sub alpha. So area to the, the left tail is alpha. Okay, so again, if any of our test statistics, the z-score of our point estimate, if they ever land in a critical region, we reject the null. All right, so if that means for the two-tail test, and I'll just write it in the margins, you have enough room on your paper too. We reject the null if the point estimate is in the critical region. So for two-tailed test, that means Z0, our test statistic, is either less than our critical value, negative critical value, or greater than our positive critical value. For a right tail test, it means that our point estimate or test statistic is bigger than our critical value. We reject the null. And then finally, for our left tail test, it would mean that our test statistic to fall in the critical region and reject the null has to be less than our critical value. So essentially, if Z0 is in the critical region, we reject the null. And you say we have evidence to support the alternative. So that's the classical approach. Let's use the p-value approach. I'm going to say a lot of you guys are going to choose to use the p-value approach because you can use your calculator for the p-value. So let's see how this works. So to find the p-value for now, um, you can use a table or you guys can use normal CDF. We'll have a more efficient way of doing it besides normal CDF. And let's do the same thing for two-tailed. The p-value, we just look at the test statistic now. So you take your test statistic, let's say it's z naught. You want to make it positive so we can get the right tail. And you want to make it negative so we can get the le left tail. So you can look at absolute values. And the p-value is the sum. It's the sum of both the tails. OK, let's continue on for our right-tailed. as extreme or more extreme a value, so we're going greater than or equal to our test statistic, that probability. So we're looking at area to the right of Z0, and then that's your p-value. It's a probability. And then for your left-tailed, something similar except as extreme or more extreme now means less than or equal to. So that's your p-value to the left of their test statistic. Okay, so again, if we have a low probability, we reject the null. And what this means in our case is, I'll write it in green, if the p-value is less than alpha now, we reject the null.
So you can make, um, there's a little, I guess, poem. <laughs> we can say, if the p-value is low, the null must go. The null must go. Okay, if the p-value is low, the null must go. So a little acronym for us. All right, so let's state the conclusion. I think I have a little bit of space right underneath it. So um, we went over this in section 10.1. It's always we are supporting or not supporting the alternative. So if we reject the null, we have sufficient evidence to support. If we do not reject the null, we have insufficient evidence to support the alternative. So again, it's um, sufficient or insufficient evidence to support the alternative. So do not mention the null hypothesis in your conclusion. Do not mention the null hypothesis in your conclusion. Let's look at an example with real numbers, um, and then we'll go over our acronym, okay? So we have that in 1997, 46% uh, of Americans said they did not trust the media when it comes to reporting the news fully, accurately, and fairly. In 2007 poll, 1,010 adults nationwide were surveyed. 525 say they did not trust the media. At the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance, right off the bat, just to pause, that tells us we're doing a hypothesis test. Is there evidence to support the claim that the percentage of Americans that do not trust the media to report fully and accurately has increased since 1997? Okay. Lots of things going on. So, are all the requirements met? Let's do that. So, simple random sample. Doesn't say. It's not a deal breaker. Just proceed with caution. Um, is 10,010 adults nationwide less than 5% of all adults nationwide? Yes. And then finally, is our sampling distribution of the sample proportion approximately normal? Well, whoops, I said P naught. I should have said, oh no, we have our P naught right here. We have to make it. Oh wait, no, there it is. Sorry about that. Uh, 0 0.46, what I underlined the first time is P hat. We're using P naught from the null hypothesis. And then that equals 251, which is greater than or equal to 10. So it's approximately bell-shaped. So all our criteria are met. So step one is where we write our null and our alternative hypothesis. Okay, so it's P, don't write P hat. Okay, and then status quo is from 1997, 0 0.46. And so we're gonna compare that in the alternative and we wanna know if that has increased. So that's a greater than, we're gonna write to the test. All right, step two, we state our alpha. It was given to us as the level of significance Alpha equals 0 0.05. Step three, we do our test statistic. All right, so what's our z-score off our sampling distribution? So our point estimate is 525 adults out of 1,010 adults um, do not trust the media. And we're going to subtract the mean of the sampling distribution, assuming the null is true. 
over the standard deviation. And our sample size is 1010. Okay, so we get our Z score. And we want to know is this unusual? It's also called statistically significant. We got that in section 10.1 as well. So is this number statistically significant? Is it considered unusual? So is it statistically significant? Um, well, I can already tell, this is, this is saying it's almost four standard deviations away from the mean. So I know that it probably is most definitely statistically significant, but we have to go through the steps. So let's do our classical approach first. It's based on the critical value. So we would use our inverse norm, or we would go to our Z distribution table and go all the way at the bottom. And it's based on your alpha. And it's a right-tailed test. So that puts our critical value right here, Z sub alpha, and alpha is 0 0.05. So um, from your table or using your inverse norm, we're going to get that that is 1.645. Okay, and then let's look at our Z naught. Our Z naught was 3.8133. So that's bigger than our critical value. So that would put us somewhere maybe right here or even farther away for our Z naught if we were going to graph it right there. So Z naught is definitely bigger than our critical value, so it's definitely in the critical region. All right, so let's write that out thoroughly just because it's our first time. Z naught is definitely bigger than our Z alpha, our critical value. All right, so again, 3.8133 is bigger than 1.645. This tells us that it's in the critical region. And when it's in the critical region, it's statistically significant I'll just use that vocabulary too. Statistically significant. And so what do we do? We reject the null. All right. Um, let's look at, and that's what we want to do. We're rejecting the null. So we were able to support our alternative. Let's look at the p-value approach. Um, the p-value is what we have to do first. It's as extreme or more extreme a value. So because it's a right-tailed test, this would mean that on our z-curve, it's greater than or equal to our test statistic. Okay, so we could do um, a normal CDF for that one. And we're on our standard normal curve, so just 0 and 1. And we get a very small number. 0.2. Zero point zero 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 six eight six, which is incredibly small. And remember, we compare our p-value to alpha. So just to draw a picture of what's going on, what we did is we just found the probability of getting as extreme or more extreme a value as our test statistic. And now this area is much, much, much smaller than alpha. And that's because alpha, z sub alpha, is all the way over here.
Okay, so our p-value is much smaller than alpha. Let's write that out. That's another way to tell that we're statistically significant. So p-value, we compare it to alpha, very, very small, and alpha is 0 0.05. So the p-value is low, the null must go. So it's the same conclusion. We're going to reject the null. All right, so if we reject the null, that means we have insufficient or sufficient evidence. We have sufficient evidence for H1. All right, so this is how we conclude or write our conclusion. So you guys, again, this is something you're going to memorize just like your confidence intervals. So we're going to say this exactly, and it's a template. And I'll write down the template first. So there is blank evidence at the alpha equals blank level of significance to conclude and then you state your alternative. All right, so this is what all of your conclusions for hypothesis testing are going to look like. There is blank evidence at the alpha equals blank level of significance to conclude the alternative. So in our case, um, we determined that there was sufficient, because we rejected the null, at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level of significance to conclude the alternative. And the alternative was that the, and you can look back into your um, problem, that the percentage of Americans that do not trust the media has increased. Percentage and proportion, potato, potato. That do not trust the media has increased. And again, that's the alternative. I do not mention the hypothesis, the null hypothesis. I only talk about the alternative. Okay, so um, for hypothesis testing, we're going to start using acronyms because this is a lot to remember. And the acronym we're going to use is phantoms. For hypothesis testing, the second we see um, a level of significance being mentioned, we're going to follow phantoms.